if you, if you do not want your image to be recorded, just click the stop video in the corner of your screen. Uh, may I make another request? Can you mute people? Because there's so much background noise I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay, so I Nancy can. will mute people and then you can unmute yourself when you wish to speak. It's like new people coming on. This is wonderful. Welcome. So we intend to give you a glimpse of our method for putting the brakes on global warming. Um, a pretty radical idea and we're, you are doing a part of the solution this morning by becoming an informed citizenry on this subject. Um, as, as we speak this morning, think about the possibility Ability that you might want to join this team and be a volunteer. We are all, you see this flanks of people's faces up here on the screen. We're all volunteering, even our attorney. Um, and I'm, I'll point out just Peter Wadhams in the far left-hand corner is a um, top scientist who's made 40 expeditions under the Arctic ice in submarine. And with any luck, he'll be selected to do a voyage this year that'll go from Greenland to Tierra del Fuego. But he said, thank goodness it's not a submarine. <laughs> and here uh, am I and Nancy, our next speaker, and Kevin, the president of our organization, who lives in England, who <laughs> lives in the UK. Um, so Nancy, I'm going to give you an introduction to the topic. And let's see, I, I don't want this slide right now. How do I, hmm. how do I change slides, Nancy? Oh, you'll have to tell me how, which slide would you like? Oh, okay. I'd like, I'll, I'll stay on this one for a second. Okay. You say, well, just to outline the plan, but between now and one o'clock that I'll talk a little bit in introductory language, hopefully for a soft landing. And um, I have two stories to tell you, one about two gases and one about the discovery of our method. And Nancy will speak more about the, meth the method for depleting methane from the atmosphere. And then Kevin is going to talk about what kind of timetable we need to be on to make this work for human survival. Because what we're talking about here is survival for sure. Next slide, please, Nancy. Do you want this one or the next one? There, there we go. Just, um, I, I'm not gonna read all of, all of these words. This is a lot of words. But just to mention that we have some excellent endorsements from world leading scientists um, like Sir David King who's the first one listed there, who was the chief scientific advisor to the UK government under both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Um, so top UK scientist. And Matt Johnson is an atmospheric scientist who is heralded for being able to figure out air pollution in his part of Denmark. And he's considered quite, quite the authority on atmospheric chemistry. It's great to have him running. He's in charge of running the lab tests that we've begun. Next slide, Nancy, please. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you two stories. Two. Zoom tight. The first story is about two gases. And if you leave this morning's talk with understanding these two gases, those of you who are new to the subject, you'll be a, a big step forward. The two gases that I wanna talk about are CO2 and methane. The problem we're looking at here today is warming, warming the planet. And the way warming is working is by these two greenhouse gases and some others, but these two especially, absorbing the sun's heat and not letting it reflect back into the cosmos. 
So the big one is CO2, and that's the one everyone talks about. We've got to reduce CO2 emissions. We've got to do more than reduce emissions. We've got to get out the ones from past year's emissions as well. But CO2, carbon dioxide, is notoriously difficult to get out of the air. Various teams are trying it around the world and it's proving difficult and expensive. But then the second most common greenhouse gas is methane. And what we have, we believe, is a simple, easy, cheap, safe, natural method for getting rid of methane. So this is radical and very significant on the world stage. And this is just a, a map that shows you methane concentrations, in, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, Russia, the US, the Arctic Circle, and Southeast Asia. Methane has many, many sources from fuel production, fossil fuel production. It's the biggest portion of natural gas from wetlands, from agriculture, from garbage dumps. Methane has many sources. And the most scary source of methane is in the Arctic, along the continental shelf in the shallow seas of the Arctic. There are deposits of methane that have been held in place by freezing and water pressure for eons. And now as the Arctic is warming up, there's a danger that those methane deposits will be released and float up, float up through the water column into the air and be huge releases, perhaps as big as 50 billion tons of methane. That's not an imaginable number, but could increase the Earth's warming by more than half a degree in a few months. This could mean it could mean the end of human civilization. So we are feeling it's really urgent for us to get our solution to methane depletion in operation. Nancy, could you give me the next slide, please? Everybody knows what warming is doing to the planet. The huge wildfires. Next slide, please, Nancy. In the Arctic Circle, um, the melting of the permafrost because of the global warming has led to destruction of infrastructure and housing. Um, cities are suffering in, near the Siberian, near the Arctic Circle in Siberia. So the problem is warming. And if these two gases are the main sources and we can't do much about carbon dioxide yet, though we continue to work on it, just like solar power used to be too expensive and now it's, now it's lower than fossil fuels. We're hoping that will happen with CO2, but it's not for a long time. And in the meantime, if we can deplete methane, that can give us time. It can grant us a, a reprieve of the warming because methane contributes one third of global warming. So if we can deplete that, we can give ourselves time to, to deal with the CO2 as well. Um, so I'm gonna quickly tell you one more story. If you give me the next slide, please, Nancy. It's the story of our dis discovery of the method for depleting methane. This gentleman holding the rock is Franz Erste. Franz is a brilliant chemical engineer in Germany. And some couple decades ago, he got concerned with help, trying to help villagers in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is shown on the left, very low lying country, as you all know, and seriously in danger of sea level rise, ruining, ruining the viability of the country. So Franz was working on helping villagers in Bangladesh with poison in their wells. And he proposed, a, he was, as he was working on this, he would dip white filter papers into a toxic solution that he was then testing. And he said he hung them up on Frau Erste's clothesline. I said, did she give you permission for that? And he, 
looked kind of shyly at me and said, I didn't ask. So he found out from hanging his filter papers on the clothesline, some in the sun, some in the shade, that methane was being depleted by an iron compound and, chlorid and a chlorine compound. And he was able to put two and two together and figure out over time how to deplete methane. And that's the method that we're using is based on Frau Erste's clothesline. So we're, Franz is our guiding light on our team. Nancy is next going to explain how really Franz's method and how it's, methane is depleted in nature and how we are going to be able to deplete it ourselves and make a difference in the world global warming. Nancy, over to you. Thank you, Jane. Okay, I'm going to mute you. And so this next slide uh, talks about what ISA is or iron salt aerosol. ISA stands for iron salt aerosol. Can everybody hear me okay? Just nod if you can. Jane, can you hear me? It exists in airborne dust particles originating from deserts and glacial rock erosion. In desert, in desert habitats, sandstorms lift ferric oxide into the air, which reacts with the salt in sea spray to form an aerosol. Iron salt aerosol is also present in glacial flour created as ice-filled rock scrapes over bedrock and then the resulting dust drifts over the ocean. Interestingly, ISA already exists in our atmosphere from steel manufacturing. And this is a picture of the Saharan dust being blown across the Atlantic. And the Saharan dust is a natural source of iron in the atmosphere. So the ISA method, iron salt aerosol, mimics of the naturally occurring process. It catalyzes methane oxidation in the presence of sunlight. And it breaks down methane molecules through a series of chemical reactions where iron three gets photocatalyzed to iron two. The methane removal process is as follows. Sunlight photolyzes iron three chloride, which releases a chlorine radical, a single atom of chlorine. Chlorine is a rapid oxidizing agent and initiates the, meth the methane oxidation reaction. The reaction oxidizes methane to carbon dioxide and water. And at night, the particles rehydrolyze and the process repeats. I'm not a chemist and obviously it's much more complicated than this. And on our website, there's, there are a couple of videos that explain in much more detail about the chemical, the, the chemistry behind this. And our website is listed in the chat room, is it? Yes. And eventually the iron dust will eventually wash out with rain, becoming nutrients for aquatic and plant life. We don't yet know exactly how iron, how ISA will be dispersed, where or how it will be dispersed. We're currently proving ISA in a lab at the University of Copenhagen. The results of these tests will determine reduction rates and the optimum aerosol size in terms of humidity, temperature, UV intensity, and other variables. Atmospheric modeling will help determine the best location for dispersal. ISA could be dispersed by nozzles or it could be lifted in the air through heat from a smokestack. As ISA is dispersed, we will have to be able to measure changes in the atmosphere using satellite data or program drones. What are the risks? We believe that the risks of not doing anything is greater than the risk of testing IFA both in the lab and in the field and then moving to field trials and eventual deployment. Because it's an aerosol and not a particulate, we believe there's minimal risk to human health and safety. Any dispersal would take place far away from inhabited areas. However, we are looking for toxicologists to conduct health and safety analysis. Our organization formed just a few months ago. 
we have a fiscal sponsor and we can accept donations just like any registered nonprofit. We will be fundraising in 2021 to raise money for further testing and field trials. We are very fortunate to have already received a $50,000 donation for testing that's occurring now, as Jane mentioned, at the University of Copenhagen. And we'll have preliminary results in a few weeks. And the reports are that the, that the testing is looking positive. In terms of our organization, we have a board, a grants committee, a website committee, a science advisory committee who, are, who advise on test design and execution. Uh, France and other people in the group are working on a, a paper that's a review of the carbon cycle in the ocean and proposes a new model for the carbon cycle where the ocean can sequester up to 40 gigatons of carbon a year. The paper will be published in December in the journal Earth System Dynamics, we hope December. We are also reaching out to potential endorsers and other partners. It's busy and there is a lot of work to do and we have to do it quickly. Time is critical. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin, who, who our, present, our president, who will talk about the urgency of what's facing us. Hi, Nancy, could you, uh, uh, could I share my screen? And I'll just answer as well some of the points that just come up in the chat. Um, post it disables um, screen sharing. So I think, Nancy, you need to enable the screen sharing. You there? You're on mute, Nancy. Can oh. I? Did yeah. you try it? Try it again? Yeah, uh, let me have a quick go again in a second. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah, I think I'm, share. Okay. Okay, I think I'm sharing the screen now, am I? Yeah, yes. you are sh screen share. Okay, so let me just put this onto slideshow view. And let me, uh, uh, no, have I, have I got the box on the side here? Have, I, have you got the whole page? Yeah. Bear with me. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, right. Um, okay, are you okay then, Nancy? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. And you can see okay, and everyone can see. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me just um, spend so 10 minutes or so just talking through the program. I've just seen the comments coming up on the chat about converting to CO2 and, if, if, and why that... that on the face of it, doesn't appear to be a good idea, but you know, so I'll try and cover that as we as we go through. And so what we've got here is just basically a conceptual outline program that, that we're working to as, 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 as rigorously as we can. I'll just go through the steps first, and then I'll start picking up the program apart. And I'm going to start from basically this, this, this bottom line, and then I'll start talking down the things at the top. But Basically, this is kind of where the program is is um, is, is shaping up at the moment. So, um, as Jane and Nancy were saying, we have the idea of using iron salt aerosols to deplete methane out the out the atmosphere, and also we deplete some other um, greenhouse gases as as well. So the idea is, was kind of where the arrow is, and um, high degree of skepticism. And then we've had a. Um, a literature review, really to validate independently the ideas. And that really gave us a significant degree of confidence. And, and that literature review was largely driven by, um, by Copenhagen University, by, by Matt Johnson. And, and, and really what we found was, was numerous um, natural analogues to, to, to the, to the um, proposals that we've got where, where, we, where we've seen um, um, metallic salts acting in a, in, a, in a catalytic way, in a way that, that, that we are looking for. And, and a real great example of this, um, you may have seen the article in the New York Times, I think um, about six months ago, maybe slightly less, about why washing um, when it's left, why wet washing when it's left in the sun comes up smelling really nicely. And if there's any way of replicating that, and the guy that carried out that study was, was um, Matt Johnson, or he was one of the, uh, the contributing authors. And basically what happens is when you put the sun in the, when you put your washing rather in the 
in the sun and if you're washing it suitably damp, the metallic um, particles in the atmosphere, trace amounts of titanium and, and um, iron oxide act photocatalytically with, with um, any contaminants um, in, in, the, in the washing. And that, that process is basically the same process that, 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 we, that we intend to, to, to replicate. So, um, so we, there's, a, there's various natural analogs that all support the contention that we're trying to push um, towards. So that really gave us uh, the confidence to um, to take the money and start doing the um, the the um, the, the uh, tests. So where we're at at the moment is basically two streams of work. We're doing the smog chamber testing, which, as Nancy said, uh, the purpose is to try and, and um, quantify the the the, the, uh, the reaction rates. And in parallel, we're doing um, atmospheric modeling. I'll talk about these in a little bit more more detail. From those. Uh, we should start being able to develop the kind of logistical and engineering solutions that we need to push forward and then start field trials. And ideally, what we want to be doing is doing the field trials next summer. So the, the program that we're working on at the moment is to get as much information as we can in the coming weeks, months, such that we can start a field testing program next year and that we can start fundraising for that and then start also specifying out exactly what that uh, um, uh, field trial program would need to look like. So it's basically the, the, these, these, these uh, two, two actions down here. And then at the same time, what we then also need to do once we've got the, this, the satisfactory re results from Copenhagen is start developing the dialogue with policymakers, uh, both on your side of the, of the Atlantic and on our side, and in particular, focusing on the upcoming uh, COP26. So that's kind of like our, our, our target. And we're in some initial discussions with policymakers on this side of the, um, of the Atlantic um, about um, the, way, the, the ways in which ISA could become part of a climate change, um, a contribution to, to a climate change response. So that's, that's the kind of rough outline of the program. Now, what I want to do is I want to start talking um, from this last thing here. Um, ongoing mo monitoring of methane emission rates and Arctic conditions to determine uh, deployment scale and also the time for, for deployment. And, and really what this is all about is setting the time scale for intervention. And um, so when we cast our, our minds back on the, the, the climate change debate, the, um, the climate change Negotiations started in 1992 at the with the uh, the Rio de Janeiro um, uh, first um, COP, and at that um, initial COP, the global temperature, the, the the target temperature was set at two degrees Celsius. So the idea was we would try and manage our CO2 emissions such that the temperature didn't rise above two two degrees Celsius. And as part of those negotiations, it was always that we would allow economic development to continue sustainably so long as temperatures didn't go above, above two, two degrees C. So there's always the caveat that really the, 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 um, the preeminent agreement was that economic development would precede any concerns on temperature rises. The two, the two degrees Celsius had no basis in science at all. It was basically plucked uh, out of the air. And then time moves along and then we see well, actually, two degrees Celsius is really going to be quite dangerous. Let's lower the temperature target down to 1.5. And that was at the Paris COP in 2015. And again, there's no evidence to support that even 1.5 is a safe temperature rise. And when we sit back and we see what's happening today, where the temperature is, temperature rise is about 1.2. As Nancy said already, we're seeing seriously detrimental changes. We're seeing the collapse of permafrost, we're seeing forest fires, we're seeing um, heat waves in key food producing regions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, the list would be too long just now to, to, um, to, to, um, to try and go through. And all of those uh, events coming together really warn that there's no way that we can allow a further temperature rise to 1.5. So the question always is, well, what's the safe temperature rise? What should be the safe temperature rise? Well, if we go back into the, uh, in, into the climate science, 
In 1980, when the temperature rise was just 0.5 degrees Celsius above baseline, that was when we first saw interacting and self-amplifying feedback mechanisms. So Peter Wadhams was the first person around about 1980 to record um, a decline in sea ice volume. Um, Jim Kennett, uh, someone else had been advising in the past, was the first person to start observing increased subsea methane releases at that uh, temperature rise. And, um, and at that same temperature rise, the coral reefs were starting to, to collapse. And, and these are all self-amplifying things. Once you start, they become impossible to stop. But even more critically, once they start, once, once one feedback mechanism starts, it can trigger another. And that, that, that second one that triggers can accelerate the first, which can accelerate the, the second and so forth. So feedback mechanisms then start interacting. And when you look at the maths behind it, what you find is that once the temperature starts increasing, then it becomes unstoppable and the climate will basically bifurcate from its current state to a new hot house earth condition. And, uh, and that bifurcation will potentially happen extremely quickly. And I think, you know, with the, with the pressures that we've now built up in the, in the climate system, we are now in, in the midst of that, of, that, of that bifurcation. Once we bifurcate into a, and transform into a, a hot house condition, that change will be irreversible, on, certainly on any human relevant time scale. So um, climate restoration programs must start immediately. So there's an extreme urgency to start pushing what can be um, feasible climate interventions of which we see that the iron salt aerosol to be one of those feasible interventions. And the kind of time scale that we're on at the moment is, is highly dictated by the warming that we're seeing in the, in the Arctic. And certainly within the next couple of years, we would we expect to see the Arctic um, to be completely free of sea ice. Already the Greenland ice sheet is collapsing and already the, um, the permafrost cap, um, the, uh, the subsea permafrost cap that, that's, that's, that, that this protecting gigatons of methane from being released into the atmosphere is also starting to, to fail. So once those things change and happen, there, there is basically no going back. So we have to start climate intervention before we get irreversible change. And we're on, a, on an extraordinarily tight time scale um, to intervene to stop that. So that's pretty much what's defining the time scale that, that, that this is working to, accelerated time scale with a view of trying to get some kind of fuel trials going next year so we can get real um, quantity certainty about, about the strength of argument that, that we have got. So um, in terms of set, the, the status of the science, as I said before, we've done um, extensive um, uh, scientific, scientific literature reviews, um, we've documented uh, natural analogues, we've looked at comparisons um, of, um, on greenhouse gas measuring, um, net, uh, the greenhouse gas measuring network. In particular, as Nancy said before, there's um, the, dust, the dust plume coming off the Sahara. And when you look at the greenhouse gas measurements um, within that dust plume, so it takes the, the uh, greenhouse gas monitoring station at Tenerife compared with the Azores, which is slightly outside it, what we do see is a, 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 is a statistically significant reduction in methane concentrations between those two um, measuring stations. Um, so what we need to do, so we, you know, we, we know the system works, we, we, know, we know that iron salts do catalytically break down um, me, um, methane. So the objective now is to do experiments to quantify the reaction rate. And there are various things that will impact that reaction rate. And Nancy mentioned before, I'll just reiterate again, it's humidity, the, high, the HCl concentration in the atmosphere, methane concentration, the particle size of the uh, iron salt particles, etc. And those experiments have now started in Copenhagen University. And pretty much this is what the experiments look, um, look like. We've, we've got uh, lab air coming in. We've got the, the iron salts um, 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 being atomized down here. And th this, is, this is highly simplified. And one of the things that, that, you know, that we can do here is change uh, the, the particle sizes coming through this manifold that gets pumped back into our reactor. And in the reactor, we've got ultraviolet uh, light at one end, so we can replicate the UV intensity at, um, at different altitudes. And this is what the experiment looks like. It doesn't look particularly exciting at the moment. Um, 
this is the, the initial prototype experiment and um, what we're having to do at the moment is, is, is replace and, and refine some, some of the some, some parts of the equipment. But we've tested the, the prototype setup out and, and, um, and, and uh, the equipment is performing largely as it's um, expected to do. And within the next so week and a half, two weeks, then we should then be at a point now where, where we can start validating um, that methane is, is actually being um, broken down and then we can start the refined experiments to see how that um, um, photocatalytic effect is, 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 is um, of, of, we find out effectively the rate of that photocatalytic effect and find out how different variables are um, impacting on, on that, that um, reaction rate. Yeah, another, another photograph there. Okay, in parallel with the smog chamber test, and this guy down here is the smog chamber, in parallel with the smog chamber test, uh, what we're also doing is, is using the GEOS Chem um, uh, atmospheric circulation model. Again, this is being set up in Copenhagen, um, and this is just one of the very first uh, slides coming, coming from it. But we've basically now um, got the, the GEOS Chem model set up, and we're testing out some initial runs and what we're looking at doing is using perhaps something like the, the global methane budget to replicate the methane emissions um, across the main land masses and across the oceans in, into the atmosphere. And from that, we can then, uh, and using the, the, the results from the experiment, we can see how methane would de be depleted as we uh, disperse varying quantities of, 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 um, of iron salts. And importantly, how we can change the radiative budget in the in the, the atmosphere. So one of the big questions that we've got is that um, should we um, disperse methane close to the methane sources, or should we disperse methane over the the mid oceans where we've got higher levels of hydrogen chloride uh, in the in the in the atmosphere? And I, I'm kind of of the of the view that that the methane is so intense as a greenhouse gas that you want to get it out of the atmosphere as fast as you can and the, the iron salt will probably work more effectively when the concentrations are higher even though that might only be marginally higher than, 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 uh, than ambient. So there's a big debate to be had exact in terms of exactly what the strategy should be uh, for the long-term deployment of, of ISA. You know, do we go for places over the ocean or do we go for, for places close to methane sources? The biggest methane sources that we've got on the planet at the moment tend to be uh, areas like the uh, like Bangladesh and North India, where we've got all the rice grow growing, growing uh, paddy fields, large methane emissions from um, um, eastern uh, China, from all the industrial plants, bigger me methane emissions from North America, from the, um, the, the, the fracking industry, and big methane emi emitting regions in Africa and the Amazon, where we've got uh, um, um, a, lot, a, a lot, lot, lot of wetland areas. The increasing concern now is what happens in the Arctic as the Arctic starts warming up again, as, as Jane and, and Nancy mentioned earlier on. And Kevin, I'll just note that we've got just 10 minutes, so to leave a little time for question and answers. Okay, if, if okay, let, let, me, let, okay let, me, let me rattle through quickly then. Okay, so factors determining modeling. One of the biggest factors that determines modeling, and again, the thing that, you know, that, that was raised in the questions was what's the point of, of, of depleting methane from the atmosphere if it just creates CO2? Well, methane will always, in the atmosphere, methane will always break down to CO2. So you cannot stop that. What we need to do, ironically, is to break methane down into CO2 as fast as we can. Now, crudely, and this is, this is taken from the IPCC, a single molecule of methane will trap about 120 times more heat than a single mole molecule of CO2. And the figures that normally get banded around what, you know, where methane is 20 times more effective than CO2 are figures that are based on a 100-year time period. So we amortize the, 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 the global warming potential of methane over 100 years. But we haven't got 100 years. We've got only a couple of years. And what we need to concentrate is on, on what we can do in the, the immediate short term. And one of the quickest things that we can do is to increase the rate of methane removal from the atmosphere. And that's where the, the, the iron salt aerosol comes in. Iron salt aerosols basically can, can remove methane from the atmosphere about two orders of magnitude faster than, um, than, 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 the, than the normal 
um, hydroxyl radicals. So what we're basically trying to do is we're trying to take this curve and squash this curve in towards the y-axis. So the, the area under the curve becomes much, much, uh, much, much lower. Um, dispersal strategies, I've talked about that, that. And I guess finally, just to close, we're not the only people thinking about methane. You know, the IPCC and many others are now starting to um, lock on to the idea that, that methane must become um, a more essential role and, and take a more essential part in, in our um, position on um, addressing climate change. Thank you. Hope I've probably gone over time. Have I, Jane? Jane, you're on mute. Yes, let's uh, go ahead and see if we have some questions. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Do, we, do we have any questions? Um, unmute yourself and wave your hand, or, or if you don't have a picture, then just speak up. No. Be Keith Runyon. I have a question. I'm sorry, the chat isn't working for me. Um, haven't we already experienced uh, some um, increase in global warming? I just wondered what that was already. Um, aren't we up a couple, not a couple of degrees, but some, some degrees centigrade? from let's say 1980? Yeah, Elaine, the, the, at the moment, uh, what, the, the global average temperature is around about 1.25 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial baseline. Um, in 1980, we were about 0 0.5 degrees um, above the pre-industrial baseline. Um, what the, the, the models, what, what the climate change models are suggesting is that with the current rate of CO2 emissions, then we will be at, at about four to five degrees Celsius. And those models um, have numerous caveats. And in the draft IPCC report that's coming out um, next year, it's due out in April next year, that they acknowledge that they cannot accurately model the feedback effects in the Arctic. So that four degrees, five degrees projection that we are heading towards at the moment is most likely to be an underestimate. So at the moment, we, we are just playing around in the foothills of, of, a, of a much more serious warming event that, that, that is likely to happen probably well within my lifetime. Yeah, and I'm 58. Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Now making this this is Michael Dunn. Hi Michael. Um, I'm co-chair of the Unity with Nature Committee of Pacific Yearly Meeting, and of course we're very interested and concerned about uh, global warming and the uh, causes and the ways in which we might uh, uh, avert some of that. Let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, at some point, uh, somebody, uh, somebody, some group of people, some organization will, I suppose, make decisions about what sort of massive scale interventions will be um, allowed, be approved on Earth. So that's one question. What, what's the red tape involved? How's that working? Is that going to be the United Nations or whom? And the other, the other question, what was my other question? <laughs> uh, we'll go with that question and let me think about what else I was going to ask you. Uh, Michael, it's an enormous question that, 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 that you've asked. Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely huge. And, and there's, there's a couple of real um, important points around this as well. Um, if we get iron salt aerosol working to the and you know to its most optimistic um, um, case, um, and we say in, you know, at the same time do some solar radiation management with a view of trying to bring the, the temperature down to to a safe level that down to 0 0.5, then it is incredibly important that not only do we do that, but we also cut CO2 emissions down to zero at the same time. So we could do all the solar radiation management, we could do all the ISA, but if we don't sort all the other things out, then you know, our efforts are likely to be overwhelmed. So, so there's a big issue there. So not only do we have to 
decide how the intervention is to be pursued, but we must also be using that the opportunity that this provides to stabilize the climate system to, you, to, to start a much more thorough dialogue as to, to, and a much more soul searching dialogue as to how we go about reducing CO2 emissions. And there's a whole series of, um, of game theory debates and arguments um, um, around that. So, so, so that, that's one big issue um, around this. The other big issue, the, the first port of call to answer your question is, well, who decides that we must go down a route a, 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 like this? And there's, a, you know, there's debates going on that, that uh, well, maybe some rich philanthropic organization you know, would step in like a, like a Bill Gates or some um, harmed third world nation like Bangladesh might step in and uni unilaterally intervene. But I think ultimately what we need is we need dialogue, um, we need intergovernmental dialogue, we need policy, we need that the, uh, the debate on climate intervention thoroughly um, integrated in, into, the, into the COP negotiations. Uh, and I think without that, um, you, you know, any, any, any opportunities that, that we create will become squandered. So it has to be integrated into, into, the, uh, into the COP talks. What, what I've been doing is, is I've, I've managed to get some conversations going with Alex Sharma, who's the, the president of the, um, of the current COP, um, to, to get them looking at the, the, the prospects of, of um, iron salt, aerosol and other climate interventions. But yeah, it's, good. it's a big, big, it's a big job. Paul's got his hand up. The, the other question I had was uh, the slides that uh, you folks have been presenting for this presentation, can those be made available? Uh, it would be very useful for us. Yeah, of course, yeah. To, yeah, um, yeah no to have access to those. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure Nancy can circulate them around. Yes, I can do that. Kevin, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask, has there been any research or is there any research planned <clears throat> to investigate potential uh, unintended consequences of using ISAs? I'm thinking of <clears throat> bird populations that might be in the place where the uh, ISAs are released or <clears throat> farmers like in, in Bangladesh that are in fields where they might be released. Has this kind of thing received any kind of attention? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at that quite, quite intently at the moment, Joseph. Um, certainly one of the ideas is not to disperse near populated areas, but even if we should do so, the concentrations that, that we will be using will be far lower than, than um, normal concentrations that, 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 um, that people experience. So, um, what one one kind of port of call um, and one yardstick measurement is 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 uh, the London Underground, um, where you get fairly high concentrations of iron particulates in the atmosphere due to um, um, the, the, you know, the, the the rail wheel wear and the and the rail wear, and um, so so we'll be operating at concentrations far lower than than, than what a, a normal passenger would see in the in the London Underground. But your, your point is absolutely valid. Um, there's big questions to be had about um, toxicological um, impacts on, on people. And, and, and there are big questions that we don't fully understand. Um, one thing that, you know, to me, um, that, 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 that's really, you know, that really got me thinking much more deeply was that in, during, in the UK, um, in the COVID crisis, when we had the lockdown, the, the rate of admissions into hospitals the strokes and heart attacks reduced. And uh, one um, possible cause for that is that there was a reduction in, in nanoparticles and small, and, and small particulates, which stopped people who were on the edge of having a stroke or a heart attack, stopped them getting triggered over into a heart attack. So there may well be um, some, some toxicological impact. And that's something that, 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 you know, that we need to really, really look, look carefully at, and we are. Um, and, the, and, and certainly you know, our initial thought at this stage is that the concentrations are extremely low. If we disperse as um, FeCl as, a, as an iron salt, then effectively what we're dispersing is, is um, basically a powdered up version of, 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 um, um, of iron tablets that are given to infants. Um, so we're, we're pretty confident that uh, the toxicological impacts are going to be or the risks are going to be minimal, 
but you know we need to make sure that we can create a convincing um, argument on that and we're looking at all, all avenues and intend to look at those um, in, in further detail. Thank you, Kevin. Let me um, just interfere here and ask Nancy what we do at one o'clock. Can, can oh. we keep going if we want to or what, do we yeah. cut off by Zoom? We, we can keep going. And um, I saw that Keith Runyon had some questions in the chat. I would say Paul's had his hand up as well. Paul's been politely okay. waving too. And anyone who feels like, well, we said one o'clock and they need to go, please feel free yeah. to just to just go. So why um, don't thank we you all for being here. have Paul and then Keith ask questions? Uh, so my, my first question was whether um, you see a, a big part of your oh task um, as persuading uh, activists because uh, my sense of the dynamics of climate policy uh, is that they are absolutely activist driven. Um, that pressure from below is uh, the only uh, possible source of, of effective climate policy. Um, and I think there is a, a, you know, just an instinctive aversion uh, to this type of intervention among a lot of activists. So I was wondering if you have sort of a political strategy, and I was specifically wondering if you might consider pairing this uh, in your messaging uh, with talking about uh, a fracking ban and dealing with, with emissions from the, the beef industry. Because I think if people are very clear that this is not a way for us uh, to continue to tolerate flooding the atmosphere with methane, with fracking, uh, and 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 uh, our our meat-centered diets, uh, they will be more enthusiastic about it. Yeah, I mean, let, 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 let me say, let me say. Paul, Paul, can you can you give us your contact information so we can talk further too? Sure. Excuse me, Kevin. Go go ahead. Yeah. Paul, let me say that the, the first thing is that this should never be a, an alternative to stopping methane emissions from fracking sites or from beef production or from landfills or whatever else. The, the first thing must be to stop emissions in the first place. And, and, um, and in particular with methane, because me methane has such a powerful global warming potential that as soon as a methane molecule is in the air, it's immediately heating the air, the air around it. Even if you had to take that methane out the, the air, say a month later with, with, uh, with ISA. So the first thing has is, is got to be to massively reduce the emissions. Now, in terms of, the, you know, of what's the political strategy and should it always be bottom up driven? Well, I think it's gotta be both. I think it's gotta be bottom up driven. It also has to be top down driven as, as well. And I think one of the, the really important things for us to understand is what targets is it that we are working to and what targets should we be working to? And for too long, people have said, you know, that we can fight climate change. We can, you know, we can have a renewable economy with wind and turbines and solar panels and so forth. I mean, it was just hopeless bumpkin. It was just optimistic nonsense. There are, there are no easy ways out, out, out of this crisis that we face. And, and, um, and one of the first, in, in terms of you know, understanding the targets where we, where we come from, the first target is what is the safe temperature, not what is a politically accepted temperature rise, but what is a safe temperature at which point things will start irreversibly running out of control. And, and, and let's start from that point. And, and, and you know, we contend that the safe temperature is 0 0.5 degrees above baseline, a temperature that we went through in 1980. And, and if we understand that and, and, and can articulate the reasons why that is safe and why anything above that is not safe, then those kind of arguments that, that, that their activists are making that, you know, that we don't need intervention, it's playing God, those arguments melt away in, in, in the face of, of, of a clarity on, on, the, on the science. Does that answer your question? Um, I want to let other people talk. It does not, but that's okay. 
I but perhaps we can continue the conversation else uh, uh, yeah, uh, afterwards. Yeah, Kevin, I, I think that would be awesome. And, well, I don't know what politics. <laughs> I'd love to hear more of your thoughts. And um, I was just looking at Thomas Crowther, who's like behind a trillion trees project, I think, or something like that. And he's a climate scientist and ecologist. And, um, and I know he holds the same concern that you do, that uh, essentially people take these solar bullet solutions, even if it's trees is the solar bullet solution. They say, oh, that'll solve everything. And, uh, and it will, it, we are yeah. in such deep crap. <laughs> we have, all, there, there's all, we have to be looking at all sorts of different ways, I think. And, and so I appreciate your concern. But I also uh, wanted to bring up some concerns that I had and wanted to kind of follow up. I think uh, it was Beverly's questions um, or, uh, you know, no, Joseph's questions on toxicity. Um, in particular, um, you guys mentioned iron toxicity in a couple sentences in your paper and then uh, talk a lot about the Amazon's um, epiphytic and uh, laterite soils in the way that those um, are basic in, you know, how the flora and fauna there actually helps cycle iron nutrients through the system. Um, but my concern is, is that the, you know, Amazonian step ecosystems are really well adapted for iron and that, uh, you know, the permafrost is not in that you could actually pass, I'm wondering if you guys have looked into whether there could be a destabilization of the soil uh, over the permafrost, which might release more methane. And, um, and then I guess the second question I had, because I, I, I'm not a master, <laughs> this is, I'm kind of curious about the impacts of HCL gas, uh, atmospheric HCL gas and the downstream reactions. That's something that's, that reactive might have. Um, and then uh, the last question I had was just about uh, what are your, I know there's a ton of money uh, coming from people like Gates that have uh, whole institutions to kind of fund projects, uh, even ones as radical of throwing atmospheric sulfates up. And I'm wondering uh, what the roadblocks have been in reaching out to uh, people who are already funding um, sort of more engineering oriented approaches. Yeah. So let, let, let me let me try and answer as many of those those questions. There's there's, there's quite 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 a few a few there, and I'll, I might forget some of the questions. As and I go. Kevin, if I could point out, you met Michael Dunn, who is co-clerk of Pacific Yearly Meetings Unity with Nature Committee, and Keith, the young man you just spoke with, is the other co-clerk. Okay, super. Okay, marvelous. Um, Keith, first of all, on, on your uh, question about silver bullets, and um, which I think is 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 just just perfectly put. Um, I don't think there are any silver bullets. Um, you know, the, 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 if we can get the iron salt aerosol working, it will be an incredibly long, hard logistical um, um, problem. But it will still, it'll, you know, it will probably be a problem less than than allowing um, climate change to run away, and. There are potentially problems with it, as you say. Um, iron being deposited in the Amazon um, might not be a big issue because the Amazon has adapted to that, and that becomes part of that that, that ecological cycle, and not necessarily the case in in the uh, in the uh, the Arctic permafrost. Now, one of the things that we do hope is that um, as we deposit iron salts over the ocean, that that photocatalytic or that that enhances. Uh, uh, phytoplankton growth, which then draws uh, CO2 down. But there is some, um, um, some arguments also to suggest that increasing phytoplankton growth over the oceans can increase methane emissions from, from the oceans as well. Um, so, and and there's, a, there's a kind of question mark over that science. So your question is, is, is uh, well put. You know, we need to be extremely careful about any un unintended consequences um, with, with the with the, uh, with the with the ecosystem, um, we're looking at that intently at the moment, um, and we and we're fairly positive that that, um, that the the long term photo, uh, phytoplankton enhancement will bring CO two emissions down. But how fast it will bring it down, and how sustainable that will be over a prolonged period of time, is is, is open to question. And as we move forward, step you know, step at a time, then 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 they're the things that we need to calibrate against. Uh, so, so you know, so that you know, that that point that you have made is is um, is absolutely valid. In terms of reaching out to other groups like the uh, the Gates Foundation and and, and so forth, um, well, we've already got some degree of funding that's come in that's allowed us to get on with the smog chamber tests. 
And I think once we get the smog chamber tests complete, and if we can you know, increase the confidence that we have got that this is likely to work and we can see in the ways in which we can um, expand and develop it in terms of a solution, then I think we're more likely to be able to attract the funding from those, those big foundations. But pretty much everything hangs on the next couple of weeks on the quality of results that we get from the smog chamber tests and the, the early um, GEOS chem um, results that we get from the simulations. But what we absolutely need to do is make sure that this is science led, that we step forward you know, one step at a time. It's good to have a vision as to where it's going to go, but we, we can't let ourselves uh, get run away with that, with that, with that vision. Well, I want to say really quick, just yeah, best of luck on like on, on that work with the uh, with the gas chambers, and it sounds like you guys are doing uh, yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing. Uh, the last question Thanks. I had was about HCL. Um, oh, the yeah. HCL, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I just don't much about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just fairly quickly. So when you get sea salt spray, the the the, the, the sea salt goes into the atmosphere and gets partially broken down. So the HCL that we're talking about in the atmosphere. It's just naturally occurring, HCl. It's there all the time, and that forms part of the atmospheric chemistry. So basically, what the iron salts do is they it speeds up the reaction with which natural uh, Cl breaks down the methane. So we're not pumping huge volumes of hydrochloric acid into the atmosphere. We're utilizing the hydrochloric uh, hydrochloric acid that is already. Um, in the ambient atmosphere, which is what, which, which is part of the reason why there's the debate about what the dispersal strategy should be. Do we go over the ocean with higher concentrations of hydro, hydrochloric acid, or do we go closer to the to the uh, to the methane source where where natural HCl concentrations may be lower? Um, and there's some interesting studies that that um, Matt Johnson students have been working on, looking at hydrochloric dispersal. Um, or natural di dispersal across the northern hemisphere and that's kind of influencing our, our decisions about how we should design um, a study that looks at the the optimal dispersal strategy it looks like jack has a question and then ray and nancy and then i thought i saw beverly had her hand up as well um, um, uh, thank, thank you for your presentation uh, i have well just a quick comment it would be helpful for me if in your future slides you that you use a, a projection of the globe that uh, showed areas properly rather than the Mercator projection you have. <laughs> That's a small, mer um, but, but it just would be less misleading. But I have a very specific question. Um, back of the envelope calculations, nothing, assuming all the engineering problems can be solved, which I believe they probably can, describing what have you described. Certainly difficult, but it could be done. Assuming the engineering problems, et cetera, be done, I'd like to know how many, under the best cases, reaction cases, without going through all, of, all the detail, in the best case, how many tons of iron in the atmosphere would make a some percent reduction in greenhouse gases or any other way you care to measure it. But I'd like to know per ton the effect. And so therefore some rough idea if everything worked perfectly, would things off sometimes do, not always, but fall apart. If it worked perfectly, how many tons would we have to put in the air with, with some reasonable mechanism? Yeah, and again, Jack, we're, we're looking at that and we'll, we'll get more refined calculations um, once we've got the smog chamber tests complete. Um, one of the, what, what, one of the, one of the, um, the other benefits of, of the iron salt dispersal over the ocean is its cloud brightening effects. And um, so if you increase the, the, the amount of, of cloud condensation, nucleation particles, then you can brighten up clouds. And, uh, and our calculations, our initial calculations show roughly in the order of 100 tons of, of iron salt per day would, would offset the current energy balance of two watts per square meter. 100 watts, 100 tons per day for per day. some... For some would, reason, well, actually, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that would lead to sufficient cloud brightening to offset the two watts per square meter e energy imbalance that we currently have at the moment. Um, and we, I, I, can't, I, I honestly can't remember the numbers offhand, but we have been looking at some 
crude estimates of the, um, of the amount of iron salt that we would need to inject to reduce the, um, the, uh, the, the global methane um, concentrations down to you know, 1,000 parts per billion. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll try and look out the numbers. And uh, Renault did some initial calculations, which I reviewed, and but, uh, yeah, the numbers escape me at the moment. I think it's about 100,000 tons per year uh, um, to, to, to try and remove sufficient methane to, to stabilize um, concentrations and start reversing concentrations. Can I so we're not 100,000 tons per year. That's really that's not. Good. That's not very much. Order. Yeah, it's 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 you know the, the, in the grand scheme of, of iron production, much. it's hardly anything at all. Hundred thousand tons per year would for some significant reduction or at least st stalling the uh, climate change temperature. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't don't quote me on those numbers. Uh, um, and again, you know, we'll, we'll get much be better ideas once we've um, finished the modeling. Um, you know, as I say. It could be that if we uh, release iron salts close to a methane source, um, you, know, you, know, you know, over say North America or over the over the uh, the Ganges Delta or something, or the, that, that we have much higher effectiveness than if we do over the in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But uh, but we don't know that. You know, that's that's the science that, that we that we want to start getting uh, solidified in the, in, in the coming coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Nancy and Ray, go ahead. You're on mute. Thank you. I would like to address what I consider to be a three-legged stool with uh, one leg being science, another leg being large, large or official institutions, and the third leg being social action. Uh, the Starting with the science, I, I applaud what you're doing because most of all, because it's honest science and it is also necessary science. And um, I just want to say that when it comes to both of the other two legs, they are tend to both be hostile to honest science. So that especially with institutions and it's not just the right-wing institutions. It's also the progress, so-called progressive institutions. The Obama administration, which came into office saying it would be science-based, uh, adopted a policy of suppressing science that was anti-fracking uh, because they wanted to uh, achieve energy independence. And so uh, going to the third thing of social movements, there's much in our social activism that tends to be very dubious about science and tends to assume that it is just uh, to shore up the um, uh, establishment in some way. We have to adopt strategies in our social movements that will fight the fake news approach to battling science. So somehow we have to work out an, an honest and integrated battle that takes place at both the social movement level, which is absolutely necessary to increase and to increase the amount of science with integrity uh, and to have it uh, become part of the popular culture through the internet. I just wanna say for those of you who have seen the film, I Am Greta, it's, a, it's a, at one level, it's a very inspiring film about how this uh, young woman has uh, help to build a massive uh, popular movement. At another level, it's a very tragic and depressing film because as she rightly recognizes and calls out, the response of all of the major institutions have been to go ahead and pat her on the head and ignore her. And her most eloquent speech of all can be summarized in about three sentences. She says, is my microphone on? Am I not speaking English? <laughs> because none of you are hearing what I have said and it is so simple. How dare you go on with your power games and destroy our lives? That is the theme that the social movements need to come again and again, more and more forcefully. I'm not talking about violence versus violence, more and more forcefully and effectively. And we have to overcome our own bigotries so that we stop being anti-science. And so we start 
supporting those elements within the institutions that are trying to go toward honesty. And we the, definitely do not have it presently. And those movements need targets as precise, as clear, as viable as what you are presenting. That's the other side of it that I'm really grateful for the clarity that you're bringing to this issue. And I'm feeling a lot of, dare I say, hopefulness or at least uh, a sense of direction. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, a, se a sense of direction, please. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, let's not let hopes run away with us. You know, let's step, yeah. well, you know, yeah, let's make sure we know where we're going and let's, you know, let's make sure we're on, on the right direction. If I, if I can just, just pick it, you know, you, 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 you you know, what you said there, Ray, is, is really excellent. If I would just like to add another leg to your three-legged stool. Sure, yeah, so you talked about social movements. I also think there needs to be a, a, a political movement as well. And I'll talk about that in just a second. You, what you talked about social science and finance. Um, a, a, a thought I, that I've really tried to push um, a, 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 with various people and, and it's the kind of thing everyone says, yeah, that's a good idea, but it's above my pay grade. And, and it was to pursue the idea that the, the people who should pay for climate restoration should be the insurance industry. Um, such a, yeah. If you are going to build an oil platform or a fracking well <laughs> or whatever, then you should be paying a third party climate change premium. So when you drive, when you buy a car, you buy a car insurance and you have to have car insurance if you run somebody over that, um, th th that that person gets compensation. Why don't we have a similar thing for climate change? If you choose to dig oil or coal out the ground and you have to have it, you have to buy um, insurance to, to, to manage those operations and to amortize that risk, part of that policy should be a climate change restoration policy to cover the damage that you are doing and uh, so I presented that to the Bank of England um, a number of years, <laughs> about three years ago, uh, to Mark Carney and the insurance regulator. And uh, the insurance regulators, uh, Stephen, his surname escapes me at the moment, was right behind it. And he took it to the Board of Governors and they were supportive of it as well, but figured that um, it was a nice idea, but we needed to get political support. So we go and speak to the politicians <laughs> And the politicians say, you need to get the market behind you. And I say, well, the market says you need to get going. So the, the ball gets battered backwards and forwards. But I think the financial markets you know, have that opportunity to actually play the policeman um, in, in a really powerful way um, that breaks down what's happening. It breaks down the 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 the, the, uh, the log jam in the negotiations that's happening at the moment. So at the moment, no one, you know, no country, no nation, and nothing, you know, nobody is 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 pushing anything forward. And it needs someone independent. And again, it's a game theory uh, uh, kind of model that, that when you get into what we're in, called the Nash equilibrium, it can only be broken by an external police force. And the financial markets are ideally set up to be that external police force. If you want the best analogy of all, the, thing, the film to watch is a 1952 sci-fi movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, when, um, I don't know if anyone's seen it, when uh, this guy comes in from, from outer space and he tells planet Earth that they've got to behave or, or this intergalactic police force is going to destroy them. And that's kind of almost what you need in, in this particular case, someone that can, can, can come in independently of, of, of national governments. And the financial markets through the insurance mechanisms are probably the best place organization to do that, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's the, 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 the term. Excuse me, the the equilibrium term. I missed the word. Just the game theory. What was the something equilibrium? The the, 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 the equilibrium term is called a Nash equilibrium. Nash, thank you. Yeah, yeah. After the famous mathematician John Nash, yes. and it's basically in a negotiation when when two when when two parties you know, are engaged in some kind of negotiation. They can either collaborate or, or they can protect self-interest. The stable position is always to protect self-interest, build up the barriers, build up your arms industry and so forth. And, and then and, and then to dispense with any collaboration. And that's what that's what's happening at the moment. So the only, and that's a natural position of negotiations. The only way to break that is by someone external coming in and imposing discipline. And the financial markets could be used to do that if we're all prepared to 
to you know, to see power over to the financial markets. So that's you know that, that that's one area where the finance markets can really start thinking much much more more um, dramatically in the way that, that, that you know, than the way that they are doing at the moment. The other thing that you said was um, in terms of your three-legged stool, you can have social uh, science and finance. I was, I was including in my social movements, uh, uh, politically conscious social movements. Yeah, the, the, there needs to be some. Yeah, the, the, there needs to be some more profound, and it needs to be security. Because right. some somewhere within that four-legged stool has to be the word security. That yeah. no nation is go, is going to pursue um, the zero carbon, zero methane, and so forth when they can't guarantee their own security. And you know, and this is one of the big the, one of the, the big challenges that the, the, that we have that we have various negotiations and, and the math shows that when you have one negotiation in, an, in a Nash equilibrium where uh, co cooperation is broken down its competition, that all the connected gains will also be in Nash equilibriums. So if, you're, you know, if your arms treaties have broken down and everyone's in an arms race, it will be impossible to get a zero carbon economy. So security is something that we need to think about. Yes. And a longer term perspective needs to be, you know, if we were to intervene in the climate system to stabilize it, can we use that as an opportunity to try and engineer a wider discussion about security, about global security? This is more legs to the stool, but if you think in terms of an all sector strategy and look at what each sector has to contribute, then I think you start getting a model of social, systemic social change robust enough to achieve what we're talking about. Yeah. And you've yeah. named several of those sectors. And you're absolutely correct that we have to also focus on security, but we have to give up the myths that our current institutions are providing security, uh, whether it be from, from war or from global warming or from COVID-19. We do not have the present systems guaranteeing our security, and we must not allow them to maintain their claim that we have to maintain them in power in order to have security. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Thanks, Nancy and Ray. A any more questions? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I had understood that the Clinton Foundation had been working on methane, but in terms of methane recapture. Uh, have you checked with them about what they mm -hmm. might we have a, a lot of large donors like that don't accept unsolicited donations, um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's putting the word out and networking thing. We're using LinkedIn mm -hmm. to see who might have a connection to somebody who works at an organization. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's very, it's not as direct as. Yeah. Well, some of the people in Quakers in mm -hmm. higher education, Friends Association for Higher Education, were. And the secondary school group were, were Chelsea Clinton's teachers, you know, at the Quaker school. Right, at Sidwell Friends, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, what is, we, really, we know what they're doing. What is the carbon, what is the methane recapture that they use? Is that just a sort of putting a valve on the methane from the factory farms or what are they doing? I mean, because all of these alternatives to this very promising program for which we're very yeah. thankful. Besides, Off the top of my head, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. But it's, and has anyone checked with some botanists or plant physiologists about the effect of the iron? Or is it so uh, small? We do have a microbiologist working with us. So, yeah. We're, we're, I'm, just, I'm so grateful for this. And oh, I just hope you. that more sciences can, mm -hmm. can join in, maybe the people at Oberlin. And, Maybe David Orr, who attends the Friends meeting in, in Oberlin, you know, where we went for a while. Oh, these Maybe are great you, ideas. Thank you. You would help us. Uh, but I'm, I'm very concerned about unintended consequences. And, um, you know, everybody that I met at the sustainable development meetings at the UN in a few years ago, where I was with Quaker Earth Care Witness, they all, of course, were making fun of... Um, you know, geoengineering as a solution, but I'm glad you're not presenting it as that, but as one leg of many. And um, I'm thankful for this. It gives me hope. I've been worried about methane for many years and nobody else seemed to be paying attention, but I knew it would kill us before anything else. And 
I just didn't know why all the armies of the world aren't uniting to place Marston mat over the Arctic to keep the cold in. <laughs> what about Marston mat over? I mean, is there some alternative thing we can do to the Arctic to prevent this release while we're getting CO2 and other greenhouse gases down? It's, 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 it's really important to think of methane as being an amplifying agent. The, yeah. the rise in CO2 is bad enough. But yeah. the thing that the rise in CO2 does is it triggers off the, the, the methane amplifying feedback mechanisms, which then inter, in, interconnect with, 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 with others. So, the, so it's, you know, it is an amplifying Not thing. From methane, yeah. yeah. But also in, the, what we in, release in, newly is... Yeah, in, t in terms of the other point that you made about the risk of unintended consequences, I think what you've got to do is balance that against the slide that, that uh, Nancy and Jane put up earlier on of the, of, of the frogs getting um, cooked in, in, a, in a pan of water, that we have no option anymore. We have to intervene in the climate system. Yeah. You know, our CO2 levels at, today are catastrophically high. Our methane levels are catastrophically high. We are walking in borrowed time at the moment. Yeah. And, 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 um, and, and the climate is changing in front of our eyes. And, um, and, and so we, we don't have the option anymore of doing nothing. So the risks of doing something are far less than the risks of doing nothing. And, and we can minimize the risk of unintended consequences by starting field trials on a small scale and calibrating and then moving up and then ch stopping and checking and moving up and stopping and checking. Mm -hmm. So we, we start small scale field trials and, and, and then you know, having established the confidence there with that we then move up to the next stage and on to, on to the next stage. And uh, so it's not a case of just thinking, oh, this works in the lab, let's throw it out and, and let's, you know, let's pump you know, millions of tons of iron salt in, into, the, into the atmosphere and see how we get on. You know, we have, we have to have a, 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 a structured way of, of pursuing and, and driving things forwards. I want to respond also to your question about um, a plastic cap over the methane in the Arctic. Marston was, that. It's like rubber. They use it in construction. <laughs> okay, I was in a discussion yesterday with some, with this group of scientists who were discussing this and they were taking it seriously, just so you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Marston Matt would be the best. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you know, they can discuss it, but the engineering practicalities of doing that it, you know, in the middle of the Arctic are, is near impossible. Yeah, you know, I mean it's just it's just not going to happen. I mean, yeah, you know, I've worked offshore in the in the past, and and life's tough when you're working offshore in, in stormy conditions, and you know. What, 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 I mean, it, it, it raises a really important thing as well about the models of, of, um, of what we, we are doing. And um, so what we've basically done is we have, since the Industrial Revolution, we have injected you know, a huge amount of CO2 into, into the environment. And I, I, you know, I, I have the numbers, I can't remember what they are offhand. Uh, and, and that's going to be there for about 200,000 years at, at best. And um, so we need to provide solutions for our, for the, for, the, you know, for, the, for the next generations that they can deploy in a way that is sustainable and, 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 um, and supportive in the long term. And we need to think about the carbon that we have injected into the atmosphere and will continue to inject into the atmosphere in the same way as we think about nuclear waste. So we have, you know, there's no question about it. When we have nuclear waste from a power station, we don't just leave it lying around in a field. You know, we bury it in concrete and, and then we go to huge, huge efforts to make sure it doesn't get into the environment. But with CO2, we're quite happy just to let it spew into the environment. So we need to think about CO2 in the same way as we think about nuclear waste. Any more keys? Yeah, I, I wanted to throw in, I, I, I was too tempted to keep bringing up game theory, and I am actually part of a movement uh, that uh, basically the entire movement is built on building political philosophy out of game theory. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was really interesting uh, hearing some of your ideas there. Um, I'm guessing you might, possibly you've heard of Nick Bostrom before. 
Uh, but he wrote a paper recently called The Vulnerable World Hypothesis, where he proposed something that sounds kind of like what you um, were talking about, where um, it's essentially a, um, he calls it a panopticon, but essentially it's like this, basically this thing that keeps us from having Nash equilibrium, <laughs> where, uh, where we're battling things out um, and increasing our choices, which, you know, will do most of us all. Um, and uh, in my, I, I come from a play different tradition, in my sense is like, can't we actually figure out strategies around cooperation, uh, which does seem really hard at a geopolitical global scale. <laughs> it seems like it hasn't worked so far. But, um, but my hope, that, that's where I'm, I would like to spring my hopes, even if it seems like kind of a moonshot. Um, but uh, I'm wondering if you could go more into what you're proposing as kind of a, you know, a big baggie. <laughs> but so I think you mentioned something about markets and I didn't quite understand, but how that would be um, out, stand outside of the geopolitical fray and uh, induce kind of uh, a single strategy that works well. Could you could you put Nick's book in the chat, please? Any more questions? We've gone way over our short time. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've, I haven't answered Keith's question yet. Okay. When, when, yeah. When, when you look at the probability of success with the current way that we're going at the moment, or the current way that we have been going, in the climate change talks, which is to completely emphasize on carbon um, reductions, that the chance of success works out when you look at it from, from game theory and you apply the mass of game theory to it at six times 10 to the minus 64. <clears throat> That's less than finding a single atom at random from all the atoms that make this planet. So we need to think of something completely different. You know, we need to understand that we must intervene in the climate system. And whilst we intervene, we must be absolutely clear as to what the capabilities of that intervention is. Such that if we say, well, this is it, we now, you know, our one option now to survive is you know, an intervention strategy, which iron salt, aerosol you know, would become part of, but it'll be um, part of, of, of various, uh, uh, would be done in conjunction with, with other interventions. So we need a clarity on the fact that we are intervening and, and, and what the potential is of that intervention and the absolute clarity that should we fail to come together globally, then we're pretty much, it's pretty much all over. Now that's a really dangerous proposition to make because if someone then says, well, sod it, you know, I don't trust everybody else then what you have a real risk of is, is a free-for-all situation emerging, where once people realize that the negotiations cannot succeed, the natural thing for people to do is to just seize what they can and, and, and be damned with everybody else. There's an incredibly fine balancing act be between how the, uh, the science of climate change is presented along with its solutions. Uh, to, to put it in perspective, I, I used to do an experiment with my maths class and um, what I used to do was I would buy a bar of chocolate. And the bar of chocolate in UK money is two pounds, a nice big bar of you know, thick, you know, you know, lovely, you know, lovely Yorkie chocolate. And I gave the, the students a challenge where they had to choose to agree or cooperate. And, um, and, and it was that the challenge was done in, in recognition of John Nash's uh, words on 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 his um, on, on, on his um, on the maths and excuse the language here. Uh, this is not my language, but this is John Nash's language. So when John Nash was choosing to cooperate or compete, the words he used was you know I would choose to love you, and his other words was f you buddy. So I gave the students the cards and and they they had to decide they had to turn the cards over. And, and work out which they would go for, whether they choose to love each other or, or, or play the, 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 the FU bud, bud, buddy card. If they both played the, the, the FU buddy card, it was eight pounds cost each. If they both chose the, you know, the I love you, it was two pounds each. And if, they, if one chose one, if one chose the, the, the FU buddy and the other one chose I love you, it was um, 10 pounds to the person who chose love for being so stupid and, and, and only one pound cost of the love for the person that you know, who, who cho chose the, the competition card. 
play the game over and over again, play the game in different with different groups, and I say to the class, we're going to play this game, say, set seven rounds. If you can keep the, the, the you know, this, this cost below a certain amount, then um, I would give the class um, two pounds, I would give the class five pounds, and, and the, the money would be shared out amongst the students. If not, the person with the lowest cost of love would get the bar of chocolate for two pounds. So the, the aim was the, 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 the value of the game was greater if everybody could, pr could play the, the, the competition. But once someone starts playing, the, co the, 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 uh, the, sorry, the value of the game was greatest when everyone cooperated. But once one person decides, I'm gonna go for the bar of chocolate and stuff everyone else, then, then, then he can get the bar of chocolate and it starts a race for the bar of chocolate. And, and the whole idea of, of cooperation amongst the classroom disappeared. It was a fascinating game. I played it over several years amongst different classes. The results were always completely predictable. And, 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 and you know, that in a nutshell, I think, is, is a measure of the, of the dilemma that we've got. We need to stop this danger of a free-for-all, of this emerging into a free-for-all. And I think if we can be clear on, on the potential of, of, um, of, of intervention, that it can be used as a way of stopping that slide into a free-for-all, then we've got something to take forwards. I, I want to just throw in uh, that uh, I think Paul threw something into the chat that um, I thought was really, um, really important, which is, uh, which is built on something and I kind of wanted to get your feedback on it. Um, but, you know, there's the uh, clap rate down hypothesis. And my understanding is that in general, the scientific community has been not back, you know, obviously that thing's a huge concern, but backing away from some of the extremity of that um, as a whole. Um, and, but that it's still a large concern, but like the paleoclimate data doesn't quite back it up in this, in a way that some people thought it might. Um, and that, uh, but then I'm wondering, Paul just threw in this thing in the chat about soil microbes. And, um, I realized that you didn't really, uh, about how that was actually, um, sequestering, like that the release of this carbon was actually really increasing the microbial, uh, sequestration. And, uh, and I was wondering what your thoughts are, if you've heard of that feedback loop, uh, what your thoughts are on that feedback loop and other sorts of yeah. things well, that well, might impact with the ISAs on soil. Sure. Well, it, it, it seems to me that, that um, the people who support the iron clathrate hypothesis generally are the people who are doing the research in the, in the Arctic at the moment. So people like Natalia Shakova that, 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 we, that we're, we're, uh, we're interfacing with. Uh, Peter Wadhams and so forth. People who have actually been in the Arctic, taken the measurements are the ones that are coming to the conclusion of, of the iron hypothesis. The people who are saying that there's no such thing as the iron hypothesis tend to be computer models that sit somewhere else in the world, miles and miles away from, from, the, from the field. And, and um, uh, often they base the argument that, that there's no evidence in this in the paleoclimate records because we don't see the, the methane. But remember, methane is, an is a gas that's lighter than, 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 than atmospheric. So it rises quite quickly. So it doesn't get trapped that, that, that readily in, in ice core samples. So I think the argument for, for, the, for, the, for the clathrate hypothesis is very strong. And, we're, and, and you know, we're seeing increasing evidence of that. So Natalia Shakova is in the Arctic at the moment uh, and on the research vessel. And, uh, and we, you know, we look forward to the, to, to the next um, set of results coming from them, but we don't really look forward to them. But um, yeah, we want to see them. Uh, so Heath was referring to work by Purdue uh, that was done in the Arctic that is about th how the same uh, warming that is causing permafrost thaw is also increasing soil microbes that function as a methane sink. Now, I'm not endorsing the study, but it's, it has gotten fairly well received. And it is not isolated. There is other evidence, uh, near term, uh, yeah. real world live evidence, that the Arctic is not producing methane uh, at the rate our worst case scenarios assume that it would. Uh, and I'm a big fan of worst case scenarios when it comes to policy. I think we should always assume uh, mm -hmm. the worst. But, but we should also not deprive ourselves of hope. Now, mm -hmm. Purdue's work, uh, suggests that those soil microbes, what is the difference they make? Uh, the difference they make is the difference between methane emissions doubling uh, and an 18% increase. Uh, so that's a big difference uh, that one would want to be taking into account, I think. 
yeah. the last thing I want to say about that is just as someone who spends a fair amount of time uh, talking with indigenous leaders, uh, and and also uh, I'm a big fan of scientists who respect indigenous uh, ecological knowledge. It, it seems fairly clear uh, that our whole way of thinking, our whole mechanistic model where it's, you know, input A produces output B, um, has been a catastrophic failure. Um, so I do think it's good if you can in your messaging, I'm not doubting that this is a worthy proposal, but if you can in your messaging, uh, kind of, of, of convey more of an ecological awareness uh, so that it doesn't appear to be one more um, kind of ill-considered mechanistic, uh, you know, attempts to kind of swat or whack-a-mole <laughs> uh, a, a challenge. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 uh, thanks for that, Paul. I mean, yes, yeah, that's, that's uh, great, great advice. And um, I think what I would say on, on the microbes, you know, if the soil microbes, you know, I, I have followed that study to some degree, if the soil microbes are working effectively uh, to take methane out, out of the atmosphere, then whoa, that's great. I mean, absolutely superb. You know, thank God something you know is, is not at, at our worst case. You know, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and all that kind of good stuff. I'm right. You know, I'm right behind every one of those one of those those those, those microbes, but it doesn't explain why the, the greenhouse gas measuring station in Barrow, Alaska is showing some extraordinarily high measurements at, at the moment, you know, 3000 parts per billion. I mean, just ridiculous numbers, almost, you know, just way, 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 way off any, any past um, sets of data. And that's only been over the last 18 months. Um, so there are still some extremely di you know, uh, disconcerting spikes that are coming up across Basically across all the greenhouse gas measuring networks um, across all the, all the Arctic, so um, you know, great for all those soil microbes. I just wish they'd be doing an awful lot more. Um, the the other thing is, even if the methane clathrate hypothesis turned out to be a dud and it, and, and it was not going to get you know we weren't going to get some some great big methane um, release in the Arctic, and you know, hopefully maybe that you know it will be a dud and maybe we won't. But even if, if, if it is going to be a dud, we still need to get methane out of the atmosphere. It is still at a catastrophically high, high level. We can't survive at, at, at the combination of high CO2 and high, and high um, methane uh, concentrations that we have today. Whatever happens, we need to intervene. And what we have to hope for is maybe something else will come along that says, you know, that the, the methane clath rate um, will not be as And it, uh, we, one of the things that also again, comes from that mechanistic yeah. Cartesian split that Paul referred to, which is always dangerous, abstracting and assuming a, it's it's a, a uh, well, it's a assuming that it's all equal. It is that we think of bodies of water like the Arctic Ocean as sort of uniform, but actually there are currents, and that may explain the varying levels detected there are currents that flow and then that would help release or not release uh methane um and so having grown up in the great lakes you know you never want to see an ocean or a body of water as as uh, all uh, homogeneous but mm. um, i'm still worried about the water so my partner he did take more college mm. chemistry than i did in germany and when he heard that the ch4 becomes CO2 and H2O, he worried about the amount of H2O. And he wanted to say something, but he thought he should hold back. So what about the amount relatively of the H2O produced? Because this would just create more wetlands, more methane, and more uh, water, the biggest greenhouse gas, right? So, I mean, not as bad as methane, but big. So how much water, relatively speaking, from a CH4 comes out as H2O. I mean, well, it, it, well, if you've got C CH4, you, you've got two, you've got four hydrogen molecules, uh, and so you've got four hydrogen atoms in every molecule of 
of, of, um, of, 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 me of methane and water has got two hydrogen atoms in every molecule. Right. So for every molecule of, of, um, of, of methane, then you get two molecules of, of water. That's basic arithmetic. Um, right. So that's... Whatever you do, if the methane comes into the atmosphere, it will always break down into CO2 and H2O, either by, the, by microbes or by ultraviolet or whatever else. You know, that's just what happens. And the, the thing that we need to do is cool down the planet as much as we can. In particular, we need to, it looks like we need to cool down the Arctic regions as much as we can to stop the amount of methane being released or to reduce the rate of methane emission into the atmosphere. And, if, and what we, the danger that we have is because methane is such a potent greenhouse gas that when it gets into the atmosphere, if it goes in at a high rate, then we, we trap a large amount of heat in a very short period of time, which then allows other methane related feedback loops to trigger off. So the methane problem is fundamentally a problem about rates. It's about the rate with which methane is entering the atmosphere, where CO2 is a problem about cumulative emissions over a period of time. Mm -hmm. There is a little upside that I notice is completely absent um, from your presentation. And it's something that I use routinely in talking about the fracking ban and that Robert Howarth at Cornell talks about, about the, the rationale for banning fracking immediately. And that is that methane persists in the atmosphere, uh, not for the 300 to 1,000 years that is usually cited for CO2, uh, but for 12 years. Um, so if you stop emitting massive volumes of it, and, and Howarth is right, and I think pretty sure he is, uh, at least half the increase in methane emissions globally uh, since 2007 is the fracking boom. So when you stop producing that volume of methane emissions, what happens is the concentration in the atmosphere actually falls. And so when I'm trying to explain why we need to act on methane, my messaging is mostly positive. It's about, you know, we, that's a concentration that we can actually reduce in the near term, which means we're slowing warming. We're not just mitigating emissions. Exactly. Um, yeah. But that is not, I did not see that in your presentation. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yeah. Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you on that. It just, um, there's only so much time, time to talk about it. And I just wanted to concentrate on the work that we, would do, we are doing. But the only way out of the climate change crisis that we have got at the moment that I can see, unless anybody can prove otherwise, um, is we tackle short-lived greenhouse gases, namely methane, by increasing the rate of removal and, and, and decreasing the rate of emission and we have to go down the solar radiation management. That's it. You know, solving climate change is that simple. We can't do anything about the, uh, the amount of CO2 that we have in the atmosphere in any time soon, and not, certainly not before any irreversible tipping points are, are passed in the climate system. And it's damn near impossible for us to get to expect any kind of political change to move to a zero carbon economy in the next year or you know, ideally, we should have had a zero carbon economy from 1980 onwards when we got to 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. We are in a pickle. And, you know, I, I, when we're in more than, more than a pickle. We're in a night, nightmare situation. And, you know, what you're saying, Paul, I'm 100% behind. Yeah, we absolutely have to stop emissions of, of, um, of, of methane in every place in, in, in the week that we can. The fracking industry is, is outrageous that they've been allowed to get off with, with what, they, what they, they have gone. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. When, when, when it's when the fracking boom started off in the UK, I went to all the various uh, anti-fracking sites and learned up as best as, as, as I, I could, and that was kind of my introduction into the dangers of of, of, um, of methane there. And yeah, you know, I was already, yeah, you know, I, I reckon that you know, yeah, you know, I was already a fairly well-informed climate climate um, person, <laughs> and. And it was really depressing that you know, you know things are you know back in 2007 things were already looking really super bad 
and then the UK moves down this down, down this, this fracking boom. It was really depressing to try and come to terms with. But yes, yeah, so I'm right with you on that Implicit, one. implicit in what we're talking about at this point. Jane and Nancy invited volunteers. And I think some of us, especially we're all part, I'm also part of the Pacific Yearly Meeting. I think we need to develop with your help a sustained in-depth conversation about the social dynamics, the messaging, the targets there, and which are social targets as well. And to be as precise as we can, because some people need to hear the message, do or die. You, you know, this is our absolute last chance to survive. And I don't even say civilizational collapse. I think we're looking at, at extinction. But mm -hmm. anyhow, there's the do or die message that certain people absolutely need to hear. And they need to have the clarity about therefore what that you are providing. Very clear policy targets, funding targets, and appealing, as you said, to markets and to other sectors, each of which can have a critical role in this. At the same time, we also know from the Yale conversation studies and a number of other things that if you hit a lot of people with this message, you induce climate grief and absolute paralysis and despair. So to be very discerning in what messages we give to which there's an underlying coherence to the strategy and precise targets. I believe that is a task our Quaker community among working with others could try to get clear about we clearly can then reach out to our own communities with that message, but we're also networked into other faith communities. And in turn, faith communities can have considerable amount of impact on uh, politicians and policy movements. So I wanna name that as something I'm realizing from your talk today, that the work that we may have ahead of us with the clarity that you have and Jane and Nancy, not only about the science, but also about the politics has been very helpful. Yeah, thanks. So, um, oh, Ted, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, hi there. Um, so I'm also involved um, as a volunteer with the Restore Climate, been posting a lot in the chat. Um, and I want to say a couple things. So one is this has just been an amazing, wonderful conversation, quite different than the biweekly um, restore our climate conversation we have, which is all about the planning. So I love the politics and the social stuff. Um, and in response to you, Nancy and Ray, um, you know, please join us. Um, it, there, it, it is a huge undertaking and there is the social, political and messaging. Um, however, I want to share something that Clive, who's another one of the organizers, said on our call yesterday, or I guess it was Friday, two days ago. We had four or five new people who had joined our bi-weekly meeting for the first time. And he was calling for volunteers, but then he also shared with everybody, and so I'm sharing this with all of you, that we're all volunteers. We mostly have other jobs. Kevin is very busy outside of this. And so our capacity and our bandwidth is limited. And so as much as we want you all to join us, our ability to like put you all to work or get you, you know, it's, it's a challenge for all of us. So um, I think I can speak for Kevin, Nancy, Jane, and Clive, and the rest of us, Franz, um, that we're thrilled at your interest and enthusiasm. And we just ask for patience as we figure out um, how and where to put you all to work. <laughs> um, and as the uh, treasurer, if I may be so bold as to point out that in the chat and just go to restoreourclimate.earth, a simple thing you could do is go to our donate page and donate 10 or 50 or 100 or $1,000 <laughs> because we are, um, you know, sort of living on fumes here and um, the finances are as valuable as your time and effort. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, well said, Ted. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the natural response uh, for us is to encourage as many people cut to come in, but it's, it, you know, it's it's a great uh, travesty and a misdirection of of, of um, your trust in us. If you come to the meetings every fortnight and we end up, you know, in profound in, in, in detailed debates that have no relevance to you at all, and um, so it's it, 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 yeah, it's 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 nice to say everyone come in and join us. But in fact, Peter Wadhams and I well, had, had had a chat today about just how effective that can be. Sometimes you get someone coming in, and that, and after a couple of months, you say, "Oh God, I'm bored to hell coming you know coming to the Friday meetings all, 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 all the time." So it's a it's a real it's a real balance to try to try and and, and judge and test. I think I'd like to know because I was, I was naming to, uh, I was naming. Uh, to something a, a self-organizing yeah. uh, proposal we quakers are good at that and carving out a task that could make sense to us where how we're positioned what our strengths are etc what is clearly needed yeah. and coordinate with you what kinds I, of I think, I, I think would be most yeah. mutually beneficial I, I think nancy that is that yeah actually perfectly put as well because the big thing now is that general discourse in how we, as a global society and as a global community, understand the challenges ahead of us with intervention in the climate system. Um, you know, how we dispel the concerns that other activists have, how we understand you know, the wider in, in interconnectivity. Um, and that's something I think as a few people have said, you know, they, the, the communities such as yours uh, uh, you know, are well placed to start those 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 conversations. Um, yeah, I can pump prime it. I can help direct it. Um, and and but I think it's it's understanding that yeah that wider dynamic now um, is the next really really important thing for uh, and that and that requires input from all sorts of areas. You know, there's the three legged stool or the four legged stool. There's you know, this this Paul's challenges on on the uh, you know, on on the on, on the, um, the, the the methane clath rate versus microbial hypothesis and so forth. Yeah, there's you know, this is a really really, really complicated um, um, picture, and none of us are experts on it. None of us can be experts on it. Yeah, you know, we've never yeah you know, the we we have never been in a planet with seven point five billion people on it all fighting like cat and dog, all running out of resources at the same time as CO2 levels have reached catastrophic levels. There is no history, there's no experience to equip us for what we, for what we are going through at the moment. And, um, and, 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 and we, need to, we need to absolutely you know, open our eyes, our ears to input everywhere and, 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 and develop that widest conversation that we can possibly manage. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Nancy, one thing specific that I would like to talk to you more about is reaching out to um, climate activists who are, who, who, I don't know the best way to say it, who are not open to conversations about what is called geoengineering, because I think if we can bring those, that segment of activists on to the climate repair point of view, rather than the geoengineering point of view, it would be it, we would we could collaborate very effectively. Absolutely, I'd be happy to, and I've given a lot of thought to that, Nancy. So yeah, okay, good. And, and we have we, we have made very really, good use of people who yeah. have volunteered. All the volunteers who've joined are are really well employed at this point by Restore Our Climate. Leoma's hand's been up a while. No. Well, I'd just like to summarize from a very simple kind of fifth, sixth grade level. Uh, so methane normally breaks down into carbon dioxide and water in about 12 years. But using this process, you can break it down faster. How much faster? is a question. Yeah, about 100 times faster. So instead of 12 years, what does 100 times mean? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Yeah, but we can't break it all down. 
It depends how much ISA you put in the atmosphere. I mean, what, what you what you basically got is you got something like the half life of, of a of a, um, a radionuclide. You know, right. you talk about half lives of, of plutonium or uranium or, or whatever else. So the half life of plutonium is twenty four thousand years. After twenty four thousand years, its radio its radiation has gone down by half. Then it goes down by half again, and so forth. But well, methane does something similar in the in the atmosphere. The half life uh, to get methane decomposing completely in about a 12 year period requires a half life of around about four or five years. So that, you know, that methane um, reduces uh, primarily as a consequence of the OH radicals in the atmosphere. What we propose is we increase the, the, the amount of iron in the atmosphere, which then, as I say, releases chlorine from the naturally occurring HCl in the atmosphere, which then breaks down the, the, uh, the, um, the methane, that, that, that chlorine then recombines back with the iron and the process then continues and continues. So how fast, you know, how much you know, do we reduce that four year half life by? Do we reduce, do we reduce it down to like just a few weeks for the whole, uh, uh, it, for all the methane in the atmosphere? Well, we don't know, highly unlikely. But if we can maybe take, if we can, reduce a significant proportion of methane down from four years down to you know, a few weeks, then we can maybe make a big dent or we hope to make a big dent on the atmospheric concentration. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of, of unknowns around an answering that, that question in its entirety. But if you have a, you know, a, a fixed volume of, of, um, of, 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 of atmosphere with methane in it, and you stick some iron salt in it um, with, UV light, then you can disappear the methane in, in hours, which normally if the methane would take day, you know, would take weeks, years to, to, to decompose. But if you can get that particle all the way around the world instantaneously, then you could get all, you know, all the methane out of the world, but you can't do that. Right. So it depends, it depends on how long the iron salt can stay in the atmosphere, you know, what it's, you know, how, how well it disperses and so forth. And the crucial part about the methane is its tipping point of capacity because it is so, because it is such a potent greenhouse gas that it could push tipping points. Well, tipping points are already being pushed. We're right. already I mean, push them faster. Yeah, we're already past tipping points. We went past the tipping points in 1980. We are in the accelerating phase of climate change now. And it's what we need to do now is stop that acceleration. So it's not about stopping the tipping points. It's about stopping the acceleration of the tipping yeah, points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we went past the tipping points in 1980 when I barely even knew climate change. I, yeah, think, I think Leoma was talking about, as you named it earlier, you didn't use this phrase, but the, passing that point of no return when mm. human actions can no longer, uh, we're so close to that. Sure. And that yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, th thanks, yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's, yeah, there's probably two points of no return. There's a point of no return if you do, no, if you do nothing, any, if you make no intervention. And that point, uh, and, you know, absent of intervention was probably in 1980. Should we do something like ISA, solar geoengineering, then potentially that point of, of no return moves forward another 10, 20 years. There's a, in, 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 um, you know, in, in paleoclimate record time periods, that time period is, is, is a blink of an eye. We've got, to, we've got to act incredibly quickly at the moment. I'm just trying to understand in very simple terms and terms of talking to people because I like to be able to be accurate when I'm simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we would like to be more accurate as well. And that's why we're trying to get experiments and, and, um, and modeling done. As soon as we can be more accurate, we will let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank Our you. group has gotten smaller, but thank you all for, for uh, joining in the conversation. It's really an interesting project and um, I feel hopeful. So I'm hoping that we, we have messaging, Paul, thank you for your points that we will 
work on the hopeful aspect of this and because people need to hear that we do have the do or die message but we really need that this is possible to this is possible i'd love to talk to you too about the indigenous aspect paul if you feel like contacting us paul yeah. is working paul is working intensely in africa with africans all over the continent who are coming up with the most amazing breakthroughs both in their perspective the energy they bring to it and the resourcefulness and he's putting together a website of their stories so that's another resource for us oh, cool wonderful great yeah so i'm glad um several of you saw my post in the chat that if you want to be added to our email list just put your um email in the chat um, I know several of you have already, so you don't need to repeat. But if you have not yet put your email in the chat and you'd like us to add you to our list, um, I will do that. Thank you, Ted. And we'll also be posting this recording on our website. So if you have more questions and want to go back and look at it, it'll be up there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you all for organizing. We have yet to. We have yet to meet and discuss this, but at our next Pacific Yearly Meeting of the uh, Committee for um, Unity with Nature, we will be talking about where we go next with this for, I don't know how many, maybe 100 or thereabouts meetings in the West Coast and Hawaii. And I, I'm hoping that this video may be one of the things that we will then be able to make use of with those meetings. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm extremely reticent to throw in something here at the end. I know everybody wants to go. Uh, I, one tiny little piece that I just wanted to say was uh, some of where I've been coming or like thinking about in terms of messaging. Um, I think that there's an unquestionable tenet of the environmental movement has that been that the reductionist rational paradigm of the West has been the thing that's destroying the world, right? And so it is unquestioned. And that, that notion, I think for a lot of folks, especially if you're, if you don't have a lot of time on your hands, and you're not trying to, you don't have time to look into every single thing. It's just, that's where I'm going to come from in every single thing that I see. If I see something, if it reminds me of that paradigm, then I'm going to say, this is, you know, um, heresy essentially. Um, and, and there's all, you know, as we're all aware of being here, because we've caused climate change in the first place, there's a real strong logic behind that paradigm. Uh, and, you know, um, but, I think that part of, for me, one of the things that I'm using to kind of get around that is recognizing that, you know, this is solutionism is what we call it, right? Um, but the, the most pure, the purest form of solutionism that, uh, you know, that we avoid ever having a solution because solutions are bad is itself the purest form of solutionism. <laughs> um, and so um, anyways, I think that trying to encourage people to always you know, as you said, Kevin, uh, push for deeper and harder answers um, is is what's what's necessary. Well, Super. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming on and, and uh, taking take, taking thank time to so much. listen to us. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Good night. Thank you, Nancy and Jane. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Fine. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.